Hello there, welcome to Showcase. Having received both industry awards and high praise, the marvelous Mrs. Maisel became a hit with critics and audiences alike, and for good reason. The series challenged the norms of storytelling from the get-go, but now it's saying goodbye. What drives Midge Maisel? I want a big life. I want to break every single rule there is. Oh. Mrs. Maisel, the housewife who decides to become a stand-up comedian in mid-1900s New York, is calling curtains with her show's fifth season. It's a busy professional office now. Critics say what made the series such a success is its great character study and gender awareness. Anything of worth in life has ever been happy. Maisel steps out of her comfort zone to enter a man's world profession. And she does this at a time when women were expected to only have certain social roles, like that of a homemaker or maybe a secretary. Yes, me. me and my stupid manifesto make me a headliner. No opening act for anybody. What an idiotic thing to say. What's it all idiotic? The part about being able to say what you want to say? I was smart. But the character of Mrs. Maisel is not without her faults. I mean, I'm not as tough as I thought I was. I mean, look at me. Reviews suggest the farewell season brings more complexity by having her try to right her wrongs in the name of success. But with this sentimental send-off, the makers of the show say they wanted to take audiences on an equally emotional roller coaster. I'm so sorry, Susie. God, I'm so stupid. We had a plan, and then I went rogue. I, I tried to do it all myself. I shouldn't have done that. Go big or go home. I mean, you know, Ma Ma Maisel, Maisel's never been a shrinking violet show. You know, Ma Maisel's not a, oh, look over there show. Maisel's like, ah, look at me show. So we, we wanted people to have a good time, and we wanted to uh, show off New York and the, our, our beloved town and, um, and how she was, it was so much a part of making her who she was. Um, and then, and then like, we always did want to do like Grand Central. We like, there were, there are certain things that's like, this is it, this is our last shot. Let's get it in now. So, um, there was, a, it was all of that. It was all of that. It, it was going to be our last season. We wanted to try and really stick the landing. You know, we wanted to try and, and work as hard as we could and get, as much fun and tears and horror and nauseousness in as we could possibly get. Panic. I'm in a panic. Oh, boy. Take a deep breath. I'm hyperventilating. Stick your head between your legs. Who's that? Dinah? And according to the series' star, the fifth season will deliver a satisfying closure to her character's journey. And that was eight minutes ago, so I've got... I'm so freaked out, I can't even do the math. You've got 52 minutes to write 20 jokes. Quick math here, that's a joke every 2.6 minutes. Huh, finally using math. Not helping. And I'm assuming they need to be broadcast quality jokes. Each one a winner. Dinah, why are you on the phone? I love telling a story about a woman like Midge, and so it, Midge has always been confident. But one of the things I've loved about season five is that she becomes comfortable in a different way. I love watching her step into this man's world and while we couldn't slow down, you know, we're never allowed to slow down, she felt less frenetic to me, more, more comfortable standing her ground and on her own two feet. And it was exciting to be able to play that growth this season. I don't hate Mel Brooks. Me neither. George mentioned some girl was starting with us. He didn't say when. Well, I'm some girl and today is the day. Who's George? You'll know him when you see him. Mothball. Reviews tease that the closing episodes do justice to Midge's character. Midge? Never trust people whose names don't rhyme with anything. Smidge. Bridge. And that viewers will be proud with the way her journey ends in a man's world with the finest possible farewell. Hi. Hey, any idea what 20 and 1 is? Nope. The Gordon Ford Show. Yes, he's quit smoking. While we're spreading the word now, we weren't keeping it from you.
A museum in Kuwait is running an exhibition on the golden age of Arabic and Islamic sciences. Along with seeing old manuscripts and maps, visitors can also learn about a number of breakthroughs and achievements that helped shape modern-day science. The Arabic Islamic Science Museum in Kuwait gives an overview of Muslim heritage in the fields of art, architecture and science. The focus is on the pinnacle of the Islamic sciences. At the Arabic Islamic Science Museum, we focus on what is described as the golden age of Arabic and Islamic sciences. From roughly around the 2nd to the 6th centuries on the Islamic lunar calendar, which corresponded to the 9th to the 14th centuries. It is when brilliant names emerged from the Arabic Islamic civilization in all areas of science. We have a special focus on architecture and Islamic art from that era to this day. Scientific tools, once used in astronomy and medicine, the Piri Reis map showing both the Americas for the first time and as well as a map of the world as it was known back then, are just a few of the displays. This is one of the very rare museums around the world that focuses only on the Arabic and Islamic sciences and arts. It has a special focus on a specific period when sciences and arts emerged prominently and brilliantly, and it is still yielding results today. The collection educates visitors on an aspect of the Middle East of which they were likely never aware. I can actually see how much knowledge um, was um, within, within the Middle Eastern a few uh, years ago. Um, I think this has changed uh, in the last few years where more Western countries are more into science, but um, the, the basic knowledge which the Western science is based on is, in my opinion, um, actually found and researched in the, in the Middle Eastern. And this is something which, in my opinion, a lot of people don't know, actually, where a lot of knowledge from the past comes from. And that's why I think it's very important to be here and learn more about it. The museum also features family heirlooms from Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Kuwait and Egypt and gives visitors a chance to develop a deeper understanding of the region's rich culture. From London to Berlin, there are many street art destinations around the world. And now Baghdad can be added to that list, all thanks to a group of artists given their city an artistic makeover. This is Baghdad's al qadimiyah neighborhood. Residents say it was once neglected. But the murals have transformed the area so much that it's now even drawing tourists. Ali Khalifa is one of many street artists who decorates the walls of this historic area of the Iraqi capital. Our message is to make Baghdad a tourist landmark for such kind of art, street art, which as you can see has been accepted by local people and they like it. Because it is a new kind of art, we are continuing to raise awareness through these murals, along with folkloric and aesthetic paintings. The artists are a group of volunteers called the Butterfly Effect. They are mostly self-funded, as some shop owners help with expenses when they commission paintings near their premises to attract shoppers. And residents seem delighted with the revamp. We became very happy when they started to draw these paintings in our area which remind us of the old days and the old houses which have been here for 50, 60 years. It is very really beautiful and the street looks much better. People in Baghdad have been transforming the city's walls for years. They've reflected their opinions on the walls alongside political messages of peace and unity. Artists are now trying their best to unleash the potential of the city, which they call their beautiful home. Back in 1993, director Ivan Reitman changed lanes and decided to make the rom-com Dave. Incidentally, the same year also saw an important shift in the balance of power in U.S. politics. 
And in our movie Almanac, Ali John explains how Reitman's politically charged romantic comedy predicted and commented on that shift. It's just five minutes. She walks in, you wave to the press, she leaves. Yeah, but the first lady, I mean, uh, couldn't I start with a cousin or something? She hardly ever sees him. And in Dave, she she William, the president of the United very States, very has a stroke. And the Secret Service recruits a lookalike to take his place. During his stay at the White House, Dave witnesses intrigue firsthand and strikes a friendship with the First Lady. Dave, have you ever driven through a red light? I might have. Well, let's say, let's say your mother is in the car and you have to get her to the hospital. You'd do it then for sure, wouldn't you? Yes, I guess I would. Now, let's say the whole country is, is in the car. The entire United States of America. Better known for his movies in that challenge authority, like Stripes and Ghostbusters, director Ivan Reitman initially surprised fans by making a rom-com. But despite its genre, the picture still delivers his political philosophy. Uh, okay, before we get started, uh, a couple things I'd like to go over in the budget. I think I found some ways to put back the homeless section of the Simpson-Garner Works Bill. Mr. President, I don't believe that's on your agenda today. No, it's a last minute change, Bob. Dave gets to see and speak well, out now, uh, against the, the here, things he thinks are wrong in Washington. To, uh, and he changes project. previous policies now, set by done. President William. Well, the movie was the released after the 1992 yeah. U.S. presidential yeah. election, got, uh, which saw Democrat uh, candidate uh, Bill Clinton uh, take over the leadership from uh, Republican so, yeah. George Bush Sr. They're late. We keep paying them on time. Alan has worked out a sort of a training program. Great. This is the briefing room, where the president holds most of his press conferences. Reviews say the youthful Dave and his less aggressive approach to doing business at the Oval Office is an allusion to that change. And they add that the film came out at a time when making an optimistic movie about American democracy was a lot easier. Oh yeah, don't you remember the convention speech? An America stronger than the one we were given, an America prouder than the one we found. There. Right there, on the podium, except on America when he points. So what do you do the rest of the time? You mean when I'm not running the country? Mm -hmm. I run a temp agency, you know, secretaries and stuff. You mean you find people jobs? Yes. In interviews, Reitman said his intention was not to take a side and that he used common sense in the political issues like unemployment and health tackled in the story. I was. Once. Bob Alexander has accused me of... Let me read this to make sure I get it right. Illegally influencing government regulators on behalf of major campaign contributors interfering with an ongoing Justice Department investigation and violating federal election laws in the area of campaign finance. Okay, let's get right to the guts of it. Each one of these charges is absolutely true. Clinton, who served two terms as president, was a fan, calling Reitman's rom-com a funny, often accurate lampooning of politics. And just as U.S. politics heats up once again, on the eve of the 2024 election, Dave still stands relevant, regardless of party alliances. Allegations of wrongdoing have also been made against Vice President Nance. Now, as this evidence will prove, at no time and in no way was the Vice President involved in any of this affair. Bob just made all that up. The Phantom of the Opera has been a mainstay on Broadway for nearly four decades. But just recently, the Broadway's longest-running show closed the curtains once and for all.
It was always looming far in the future. It didn't seem as though it was something that was imminent. And now that we've gotten to the last week, every moment is precious, to be honest. I, I don't think there's, I can say without a doubt, <laughs> I will be crying. I don't think there's any way I'll keep a dry eye at that point. It's it's just hard to imagine that I won't be playing it again, at least not on a nightly basis. seen it before but I'm so excited to see it. Yeah we know that this is gonna be the last matinee ever so oh my god super sweet it's her 18th birthday so I'm taking her out. I'm excited. I always wanted to take my wife to it and uh, when I saw it was closing I was like I gotta go. <laughs> we gotta come and see it but it's a it's a magnificent show. Hayao Miyazaki has long had a monopoly on the international anime market. But the past few years has seen the emergence of a rival powerhouse, Makoto Shinkai. After all, the director is considered the heir to Miyazaki, and his new movie is receiving fitting praise. <laughs> Suzume is the story of a girl who must go on a fantastical journey to stop Japan from being destroyed by a disaster. It's a human story, presented with colorful visuals. The movie was the first anime competing at the Berlinale in more than 20 years. Honey, don't take a shortcut. You always get us lost. The previous film was Hayao Miyazaki's Spirited Away. Hey! You said just a quick look! Get out of here now! What? Leave before it gets dark. You've got to get across the river. Go! I'll distract them! And as reviews will tell you, that's fitting. Masaka! Masaka! Because Suzume's director, Makato Shinkai, is hailed as the heir to Miyazaki. Like him, Makato also took anime to blockbusting heights. And his film does include references to the veteran animator's works. But whereas Miyazaki's target audience are children, Shinkai eyes the young adult demographic. For this one, he says he went back to the 2011 earthquake in Japan to tell a story about the importance of communication and kindness. For the director, these themes are important in getting by day to day. Even though his story is about the fantastique, it's essentially about life as we know it. And that comes from the director's own philosophy. <laughs> As for the comparisons, he says Miyazaki's works are part of the audience's shared life experience. Let's go. Go and that since his own film is about life, 
those visual references are almost inevitable. Given that Suzume is breaking box office records worldwide, you could say that the director is not that far off the mark. An exhibition in Zimbabwe is paying tribute to women's ambitions and their victories. And one artist stands out with her works that challenge gender roles in the strongly patriarchal country. We Should All Be Human is an exhibition that opened on International Women's Day at Zimbabwe's National Gallery. It features 21 works by female artists, which broach issues like migration, the economy and health, but more contentious subjects such as women's reproductive rights are also explored. As for this piece by Notando Chiwanga named Immortal, it challenges age-old gender roles by juxtaposing a helmet from a male-dominated job with a woven basket commonly used by women at markets. I think historically that's, it has been the case that women artists um, or women really are the subject of uh, painting, sculpture, of art. Um, but we don't find many women artists being collected by museums. Uh, but it, it, as you can clearly see in this exhibition that women have the expertise and they do have the platform. Um, and there's been a movement around the world to ensure uh, the representation, equal representation of women. In the case of Chiwanga, she's glad she's also had the chance to show off her pieces abroad. And this is where she works on her art, which tends to explore the complexities of women's lives in Zimbabwe. You need to reinvent yourself. Don't have to remain the same person that you were a long back. So mostly when I do my works, when I did that, also that piece, I was telling myself I need to reinvent the, the the concept whereby people they just see the image of a person the face of a person but the work that you do can even represent your identity being a woman and being a woman um, working in Zimbabwe is a hard area uh, it's not specifically about working here uh, it's just that sometimes there are multiple layers to expectations that women have that makes it uh, a minefield. According to the UN, one in three women in Zimbabwe are married off before they reach 18, and the country's attitudes are reflected in Chiwanga's life, where her mother is supportive, but other family members pressure her to get married and find what they call a proper job. I need to make sure that I need to perfect myself as a woman can be in an economic setup, social, so that people can understand, know that the female black body needs to stand out there, not to mean just the same, but you need to wait for marriage. But as for me, I need to be big also, not only to aspire for marriage. And she hopes both her and her fellow female artists' works at the National Gallery will inspire other women to follow their dreams. What happens when an art superstar and a fashion icon work together? Well, an exhibition called Picasso Chanel explores that very question. Pablo Picasso's paintings and Coco Chanel's designs are side by side at Madrid's Tisan Borne Mitza Museum. The show reveals how the Cubist master's art became infused with the designer's ideas for texture and form. The two first met in the spring of 1917 and became close friends. They worked together on two occasions, one being for playwright Jean Cocteau's Antigone. While Picasso made the curtains and masks for the show, Chanel took care of the costumes. The Cubist aesthetic in her early designs could be seen in her use of geometrical shapes and preference for black, white and beige. In fact, it happens 
that at the same time Cubism is also interested in monochrome, in the broken line, in geometry, in the redefinition of perspective. So I would say that the common point is Chanel's intense preoccupation of movement and the Cubism movement. That's what brings them together. They also collaborated in the ballet called The Blue Train in 1924. Chanel designed costumes for the dancers, inspired by the sport outfits she created for herself and for her clients. At the time, bathing and outdoor life were also featured in Picasso's artworks. During the war, she designed her first clothes. She designed those for the beach. She took inspiration from both outdoor clothing and also from work clothes. And that's, once again, freeing the female body from shackles, from two tight clothes strangled at the waist. This exhibition can be seen until mid-January, but the effects of this collaboration between the iconic designer and art master will probably keep showing up in fashion, whether we notice it or not. That's it for this episode of Showcase. I'm Esther Adris from me and the whole team here in Istanbul. Thanks for watching and bye for now.